Hello everyone, thanks for joining Overcome Podcast. I just a little warning about the quality of the audio. By the time that we were recording this episode, Nina was experiencing uh, some power outage due to a storm in San Antonio, Texas at that day, which was a day prior of, of her departure to Tokyo. And uh, there was a lot of things going on, but uh, we were able to get everything done. There are only some ups and downs during the interview as far as quality, but it's a great episode, a great insight. I'm very, very thankful that we were able to record this. Enjoy. Welcome everyone to Overcome Podcast, episode 40. And for this 40th episode, we really have a great, uh, very, very special guest, Nina Kutro Kelly. Thank you very much for being here today. Thanks for having me. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Oh, Nina, thank you very much. Uh, I am so happy for uh, you and everything that you've done and to be able to get to this. But before I even start asking questions, let me just read a little bit of your resume, right? Six times USA Judo National Champion, four time Judo World Team member, 2015 Pan Championship Bronze Medalist, 2015 Pan American Games Bronze Medalist. I mean, it's huge amount of accomplishment. Yes, actually, I think um, I think that might be a little bit of an outdated uh, resume because I actually have ten titles and I made the world team nine times. Oh, look at that! I'm yeah, looking at some out like of that information four, here. Four or five, uh, four or five uh, uh, Pan Am medals since then, but that's okay. That's yeah, okay. I'm looking to the Women's Sports Foundation's website, which has, oh yeah, they just updated that one, but uh, that's okay. Mm. Yeah, Nina, after twenty years, you made the Olympics and. Um, I, I'm pretty sure that is very emotional, and uh, I would like to to go back to the to the struggles to get there because the the, the main subject of this podcast is overcome, and mm. I think no one better than you to talk about overcome after 20 years working hard to get to this point. So tell us a little bit more about um, uh, some of the beginning. Why did you start? How did you start on judo, and when? Did you believe you were going to the Olympics? Uh, and I'm pretty sure that there were some frustrations here and there until you get to this point. So um, I started judo in 1992 when I was a little kid. Um, and uh, my dad took me to a local club. And I probably practiced there just once a week for about six years. And then I uh, lost in a local tournament to a girl about... 40 pounds lighter than me, and her uh, her coach was Jim Herbeck, who's my current coach here in San Antonio, Texas. And um, I I moved to that club kind of with the same idea. Okay, I like judo, and um, I like I like working out, but um, I never thought like I could be really any good at it. I just thought it was a fun activity. And after about maybe three or four months. Uh, my coach kind of said to my parents, like, actually, she could be okay at this. Like, she could be pretty good at this. Um, and I still didn't believe it. And so bit by bit, you know, I started, you know, going to local tournaments and then the nationals. And um, so I think I started with my coach, Jim Herbeck, in 1999. And I, I made the junior world team in 2002. So in the first three years of training in, in kind of a more competitive club, I think I saw, you know, what, was possible mm -hmm. uh, for the future. Mm. And uh, so the beginning, as you said, you really didn't accomplish that much. You start really early on. So the, the spark would just say, you know what, I'm actually good at this. It was when you change club? Yeah. Oh, for sure. For sure. Like I, I had done it more as an activity and also because I think, uh, you know, both my parents were fed up with me getting in trouble for fighting in school. And so they <laughs> they liked judo because I uh, didn't get in trouble for fighting and it would use my energy. But I, I really didn't have I was strong. I've always been strong, physically strong. Um, but I didn't really have any technical knowledge until I, I started working with my my current coach. I mm. see. I see. And uh, throughout those years, since it's been 20 years uh, that you've been working on that, when was the year that you were like, I think I have what it takes to go to the Olympics? 
Um, I would say so. It was in 2003, 2004. I started, you know, fighting for medals at the nationals, and I started seeing that even if I wasn't beating the top girl, I was getting really close, and then I was beating the top girls. And um, in 2004, the the point system to qualify for the Olympic trials. Um, there, there was a bit of political issue with that, and so I wasn't allowed to compete in the trials despite having beaten uh, the girls who participated in it. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was that was a disappointment, you know, and, and that was corrected after the fact. And then, you know, 2008, it was between me and one other girl to go to the Pan American Championships, and then when she went, she didn't qualify the division because she lost to a girl that I had recently beaten, so it was, it was it, there was always something would always happen. And then in 2008, you know, the great Kayla Harrison, who, you know, legendary, the best American judo player ever, mm. uh, moved into my category at the time, which was under 78 kilos. And so, um, you know, we fought a few times and I decided that I, you know, she was she was very, very, very good, very talented. And I made the decision to, to move up to heavyweight, which is unlimited. So it's a harder division you know to adapt to because you know you could fight somebody 180 pounds or somebody who's 380 pounds Mm -hmm. so it's a very challenging situation if you're not very big in the category Mm. and did you adapt very well on this category um well yeah um i mean because changing changing category sometimes is really hard right because your technique sometimes you have to readjust Sometimes you have yeah. to find a better... Well, I tried to change some of my techniques, or I had to uh, d- develop different techniques. Um, and uh, I definitely had to lift a lot of weights and <laughs> and put on some, some muscle mass and some size. But I really think um, the biggest part of adapting to, to fighting heavyweight was... Um, you know, using strategy mm-hmm. rather than strength. And so, whereas, you know, in under 78 kilos, I was probably, you know, one of the stronger girls in the division. Like I, I had, you know, pound for pound strength wasn't an issue. And it was really important for me to uh, be able to adapt uh, to, to the weight difference and really develop technique that would work on uh, the girls I was competing against because, um, you know, there was no guarantee that I could ever be stronger than somebody who was significantly heavier than me. Mm-hmm. And so then I started working on, you know, different different types of uh, takedowns, you know, I worked on my mat work because, you know, mat work can, can be people that you might not be able to beat standing. And so I really think that that was uh, improving my mat work and then adapting some techniques really helped a lot. Hmm. Um, so that's uh, that was your transition from um, <laughs> 78 to 100, right? Well, it's under 78 to plus 78. So it's unlimited. Yeah. Oh, so plus 78 is not really 100. It says there's actually no limit. Yeah, yeah, there's no limit. Um, boys have under 100 and plus 100, but women have under by, under 78 and plus 78. Okay. Mm. All right, cool. Okay, so cool. let's uh, let's move on here um, to one of the main obstacles, right? Everyone talks about making the Olympics team. What was to, to you over those, those years and, and making this after 20 years? What was the biggest obstacle, um, do you believe? Um, so I had 50% hearing loss in both of my ears. And so I once I'm actually out on the mat, I don't hear very much that a coach is telling me. Um, so that's always been something where I've had to, like, you know, have a good plan ahead of time, rely on, you know, one or two words said really loud because – I'm not going to be able to hear them because I can't wear my hearing aids when I compete. Um, It's not safe. And then the other thing is that, um, you know, the United States is, is in terms of um, it's judo development is, I mean, we're, we're not a major judo country. And so uh, there is not a lot of funding and the funding that there is, um, you know, has only ever been able to reach a couple of people. So it wasn't really 
until this last quad that I was able to access almost any funding at all. So I was self-funded for the first four attempts at making the Olympics and um, complete, almost completely self-funded. And, and so that was a, the financial element of things was pretty difficult as well. And I, I've always worked. I've always had, you know, I graduated college, you know, for my bachelor's degree in 2006. And I've always had at least a full time job and often, you know, one or two side hustles. And I was, you know, starting my days at, you know, four or five in the morning and then not ending my days until, you know, 11 at night when I got home from practice or, you know, on weekend nights, sometimes I was bartending, waitressing, whatever, just because I was trying to make money to pay for, pay for, you know, all the competitions I had to get to. Mm. Yeah, no, that's a, that's a, that's a problem that was externalized by many judokas that uh, went to this, that came to this show. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's, yeah. it's hard. It's really hard. It is really hard. And I mean, it's improving. I will say the, the situation has improved significantly in the past uh, four or five years. Um, things are much, much more fair, uh, but, you know, there's there's always things to do. And I think um, really like because I don't I don't want to point fingers at anyone because, you know, there's so many elements to, to this situation. But. Uh, you know, if we start at the grassroots level, we develop really good geo players. We're still going to have to fund them to get the experience they need because judo isn't as developed in this country as it is in the rest of the world. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Throughout those 20 years that you've been so active in judo, have you ever had any uh, major injury that you had to stop training? Yeah, I um, in about 10 years ago, I tore my ACL. Uh, it was a, kind of a funny story. I was giving up about 120 pounds and fighting this Venezuelan girl who was was pretty special. I don't think she was all you know okay upstairs to be honest with you. And she, uh, I got to the mat. I armbarred her. I um, cracked her arm in three different directions, and she screamed bloody murder which, you know, could be interpreted as a ver verbal submission because, I mean, she was screaming and screaming and screaming. But she never tapped. But she refused to tap, no. and she never tapped. And it was a South American referee, you know, and I'm fighting somebody from South America, which is, I understand, you know, there's loyalty there, but they would not call it. And so we got up, and, you know, she's got her arm hanging, and then um, she and I were pretty I mean she was pretty angry at me and she was 120 pounds heavier and we we had an exchange going out of bounds and I tried to throw her with like a hip sweep and I fell on my face because I couldn't move her and uh as I went to like get up and to like you know put my foot on the floor and, and push myself up she kind of dramatically dropped and fell on the side of my leg so it was it was pretty wow. like a cheap shot yeah so um, then I tried to fight the rest of the match. So she's dragging an arm, I'm dragging a leg, but you need two legs to walk. And it just went on and on. And my coach was telling me to, you know, to, to, to call it. And I didn't want to, and I was mad. And so we ended up fighting pretty close to the end. And then, you know, there was just an exchange and we both kind of flopped over and she fell on top. So they gave her the match, but it was pretty ridiculous. And, you know, both of us needed, you know, to see doctors afterwards and neither of us fought for a, a really long time after that. So, um, but that's really the only major injury I, I've had. And how long, um, how long were you out after that? Uh, I mean, I did something kind of dumb was I tried to fight with no ACL for a year. So I think I fought maybe five months later and I like won the Dallas Invitational because that was a money tournament. I wanted money. And then uh, I think I fought in the some, no, I fought in the judo world championships with my leg taped and I actually, uh, I think I finished uh, top 16 in the world. So that was, that was kind of cool. And then I got a bronze medal in the World Sambo Championships with no ACL. <laughs> and then things kind of went downhill the next spring because I was doing Sambo and they, um, the girl tried a leg lock. And because I had no ACL, the rest of my knee was kind of weaker. 
and I got out of the attack, but then when we stood back up and the match finished, I won the match. I made the finals that year. It was That wasn't really the issue, but I remember after we fought, like, I just couldn't walk. And after that match, it was probably about, I want to say, 11 months with no ACL. That's why I was like, I got to get it fixed. So as soon as I knew I would make the team for London, I got my ACL fixed. And then I was out for about, I want to say I didn't really compete for about seven or eight months. Yeah. Wow. Mm. How, how it, this, this time that you were out and knowing how passionate you are about judo, how were your mm. mental aspect? Were you okay just waiting or were you completely lost, not having that activity to do? I hate not working out like um i i always have been an active person and i don't i get bored if i don't work out and um i mean i stayed positive in that i had a lot of physical therapy i was lucky enough at the time i was living in france i had really 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 good health care and i had um I actually had two hours a day of physical therapy, five days a week. And so that kind of replaced my training, mm. you know, in the evenings. And even though it wasn't judo, it made me feel like I was working towards getting back to judo. Wow. So that, that did help. And then after three months of that, I was able to get back on the judo mat and like I could do some some fit ins, I could do some throws, I could do some mat work. Um, but I couldn't really standing fight for about six months. So you were doing a lot of uchikomi probably? Lots of uchikomi, uh, lots of nagikomi, uh, and lots of newaza. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this, uh, the, the time off is always complicated. Uh, and I had a time off of uh, probably more than five, four months, something like that, and it was terrible. Mentally speaking, to me was was really really yeah. bad, uh, miserable. That's why I actually created this podcast for this reason because of my injury. Uh, I, I wanted to know how all the athletes uh, reacted to this type of adversity. Um, and although you were not mm -hmm. a full time athlete because you had a job, you still a full time athlete because you invested so much in this sport and you, you wanted to. You had this dream of making the Olympics. Uh, so it probably was really tough for you to be out. Mm -hmm. I mean, honestly, even COVID wasn't as bad because at least during COVID, I could go for runs and I could lift in my garage. I could do judo with my roommate in the garage. I have a full set of mats. I have a crash pad. So it was really nice to, you know, just be able to focus on working out. Um, but yeah, in knee injury especially was, was particularly annoying. And uh, most recently I had a, an issue with a tendon in my arm and they had actually put stem cells in it two days before I found out I made the Olympic team. So that was like a very short, you know, challenge to deal with because I was supposed to rest for two days after the stem cells and I, I compromised and I rested for seven days <laughs> you know <laughs> um, but uh, that's that's somewhat back to back to back to back to normal mm. now the this thing happened after 20 years uh, do you feel that you are actually on the best moment of your career yeah honestly I, I I'd say you know there have been times in my life where I've been physically better but mentally plus physically I'm definitely at, at my best moment now um, you know I'm, I'm 36 and a half years old I'll be 37 in December um, so yeah there's definitely been times in my life where where my body felt better but I mean in terms of my brain working in, you know collaboration with my body I think this is probably the best I've ever been mm. And which is very important, mainly when you go to that level of competition, right? Because uh, you probably are able to assimilate more things. You are able to think more critically, have a better strategy, more experience. So all those things play a, a big role now. Oh, I know for sure. It, it, uh, you know, 
they say judo is like you know chess with with bruises and that's definitely true because it's not this like push push game where you're trying to gain ground or you know score goals like basketball football whatever you know it's it's far more complex than that and so i think with um with uh you know judo it's 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 hard to be dumb and be good at judo. I think <laughs> so. You have to you have to really be able to wrap wrap your head around uh, around the sport and and mentally understand the strategy in order to succeed. Um, yeah. You recently gave an interview, and I was reading this interview, and and you said something that uh, caught my attention. You said. A lot of times in the U.S., heavyweights get a lot of bad reputation because we don't look like those ripped APEC athletes in other divisions. Uh, so mm -hmm. is that really a thing? Because I don't think you ever had any problem with uh, weight or anything. Like I mean, it was your option to even go to the heavyweights, right? Yeah, but I mean, I'm still, I'm not, I'm never going to be a small person, you know, and I think... Um, even for me, moving to heavyweight, yeah, I chose to move to heavyweight, but, you know, being extremely physically fit and, and looking, you know, very, you know, slim and everything like that. And, and now I'm bigger and I actually like being strong. I wouldn't shoot like I, I, you know, I plan on losing a bit of weight after the Olympics, but, but nothing extreme. And, um, uh, but I do think it's it's a, it's a it's a combination of a couple of things um you know there's a stereotype that all big people are lazy if you're a little chubby you're lazy and there's this stereo and there's the reality that um for a really long time uh, a lot of um you know people a lot of the american heavyweights girls were just not um able to deal with the strength of the international girls and so um I think maybe because I came from a lighter division and I was trying to outrun these girls rather than muscle them, that mm -hmm. I might have figured out how to beat some of them, whereas some of the girls who had never been smaller couldn't really adapt. I don't, I don't really know, but I do know that, like, um, you know, I'm the, it's the first time a, a woman heavyweight has made the Olympic team since uh, the year 2000 uh, for the United States. So I think that's pretty and I um, and and it, it it's kind of you know you know I would say yeah yeah I might be big I might be a little bit fat but um no I mean I'm an Olympian so that's still pretty <laughs> yeah. cool so no, it's a, a it's yeah. an amazing accomplishment you know and uh, yeah. I'm not sure exactly the, the reason why because I deal with a lot of athletes in power lift strong men that they are mm -hmm. mostly they have a lot of fat they don't have six packs you know yeah. they, but they are extremely strong so being big yeah. uh definitely doesn't mean you're, uh, you're lazy right i mean it's all it all depends on your the way you look uh, uh the way you behave your attitude your posture mm -hmm. and uh, i mean it's really easy to differentiate someone that is a couch potato and fat than someone that exercise and it is just big um uh, at least yeah. i think so and i think it's a huge accomplishment for you to be the first one since 2000 so that's another major milestone no i'm i'm super happy about it and i and part of like my plan really is, you know, after I retire, you know, from competing in judo, I really want to try to, you know, develop another, you know, women's heavyweight because we haven't had one. Yes, I came from a smaller division and I kind of adapted to fight heavyweight, but there have been times where I kind of wished I was, you know, four or five inches taller and, you know, 60 pounds heavier mm -hmm. because that would have been, you know, what I needed to do to, you know, push these girls over and, you know, or pin them or choke them, arm bar and whatever. So I think that there's, there's, um, value in, in both types of experiences and maybe the key to, you know, creating a real champion would be to combine a lot of these ideas. Do we, do we yeah. have in, in US, uh, good girls, uh, uh, above 78 kilos that, you know, that can, can continue to develop young, this young generation that is coming up because in the place that I train, really, I don't have one on this division. So I never really seen one. The there's not a lot. There's there's not a lot. Um, Mackenzie Williams is about. I think she's probably 23 right now. Um, 
I think uh, she's probably the best bet for the next heavyweight for the United States. Um, uh, you know, but again, you know, we'd have to, you know, she'd have to make a plan, and and, and we would. You know, I would hope to try to help her out. I really think that she's got a lot of natural talent and and natural size and strength, which could be really useful for her. So I'd like to try to, you know, see what she can do, and I'm looking forward to that. And and there's. You know, there's people that we might not know of. You know, there might be a girl heavyweight wrestler that could be, uh, you know, convinced to try judo. You know, there's a lot of things. But the thing is, is judo, it's a, you you do judo because you love judo. You don't do judo to be famous and you don't do judo to be rich. Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of hard to sell people on yeah, it, yeah. you know. That's so. definitely true. Uh, when you are training, since you change the divisions, did you incorporate more lifting, more heavy lifting on your routine? And how many times a week do you lift? So I lifted um, probably three times a week for, I want to say, most of my career. So up until uh, a couple of years ago, I was, you know, doing arms one day, core one day, legs another day. And um, then... Um, I got really, really, I, I got a lot of issues with uh, flexibility and scar tissue buildup and various injuries. And so then I decided I was going to focus more on like body weight type exercises. And, and because I've got a significant amount of body weight, it, it does actually challenge me in a similar way, but it wasn't making me, you know, the bulky inflexible muscles that were actually kind of hurting my body in some mm -hmm. ways. Um, So a couple of years ago, I changed to more like body weight type exercises, and um, and that and that's I already had the muscle mass developed, but then I was working on maintaining it and working on flexibility and working on more more active strength, you know, emotion as opposed to just you know lifting lifting weights. So mm -hmm. no deadlifts, no yeah. squats. Um, I haven't. I actually never did a lot of deadlifts. I did a lot of squats and a lot of bench press uh and uh when i was moving up into heavyweight when i was getting bigger um maybe uh up until i want to say about january of this year i occasionally would like cycle like you know a little program like i do like a month circuit and then i would change back to to the body weight stuff Uh, with with the bench and squat incorporated, mm -hmm. um, but really the biggest thing, especially because I've got you know 36 year old joints and stuff, the biggest thing that's helped me with like explosive strength has been um, a lot of body weight stuff, uh, rope climbing. Um, uh, I do uh, stuff uh, like I use a Roman chair and I'll do like ab ab extensions, ab curls, things mm -hmm. like that. Um, And uh, I did like I did a little bit of bench press last week, but I, I really just try to keep most of my um, power, you know, strength and conditioning type stuff is is mostly with body weight. Yeah. And uh, did you feel a lot uh, difference from the cardio perspective when you were lighter to when you move up? Did your cardio was compromised a little bit? Well, that's a good question. Um, It's funny, but like when you're smaller than someone, you actually, it actually, you have to work a lot harder cardio wise to move them. And so like, for example, like if I'm working out with a, gr a girl who weighs about as much as me, a girl who weighs 210 pounds, it doesn't make me as like cardiovascular tired as fighting a girl who's 290 pounds, you know, um, because it takes a lot more strength and pull and Uh, mobility um, to move somebody bigger than you and so actually um, the, the times I've been most successful is actually when I worked my cardio to be better in some ways than when I was lighter mm. you know um, I've, I've actually run more miles as a heavyweight than I have ever in under 78 you know just because I need to have long term Uh, you know, reserves and gas in the tank yeah. because otherwise, you know, you're going to get tired mm -hmm. and then there's somebody who's also tired but a lot bigger than you in front of you <laughs> and then there's a problem, yeah, you yeah. know. So, yeah. Is, is that your reality today? You think that uh, in, in the Olympics you're going to 
uh, face girls that are much bigger than you? Almost, almost certainly. Um, there's a couple of girls who might be around my weight, but the average weight in plus 78 kilos is about 280. Oh, and I'm too Wow. So, yeah. So, most likely I'm giving up 60 to 80 pounds. So, that definitely technique will help you a lot during that time, right? Oh, yeah. You yeah, know, technique, strategy, and, and, and just being in shape and being able to attack, you know, get multiple attacks off, you know, uh, if you're, you know, in the judo rule set, three good attacks on my part equals a penalty on the other girl's part. Um, and so that's, uh, uh, something that's really important to remember. Um, we were talking about some of the, the obstacles you, you mentioned the financial aspect, um, now that you are qualified, I think you're gonna travel this week, uh, probably tomorrow. Uh, mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. was since you learned that you were gonna make the team to, you know, be able to travel? Did you already had everything planned, or it was so suddenly that you had to come up with a, a plan to to make this trip? Oh, I had. I thought I had it made the team, and so I had like I said I got the stem cells in my arm and um uh, the first thing I said when they told me I made the team was oh my god I have to get time off of work um and my job was great I sell over the telephone for a French company and I told them oh I made the Olympic team and they were like okay you can have as much time off as you need um not paid but I have time off mm -hmm. and um then the place where I teach I work at a fitness center teaching um Uh, judo lessons, uh, like private lessons, and they were fine to let me go as well. And uh, then I'm also in the process of working on an MBA, and I luckily found out during my like summer break, and so I was able to postpone the class I was about to start, and I'll just take it in September. So I had like a, I've had about three days of scrambling to organize everything, um, and then. Um, things kind of started to come together and I was able to start training, you know, two, three times a day. Mm -hmm. Is uh, everyone else from your team already there? No, the lightweights went, well, the lightweight girl, uh, Angie, she went with some training partners and one coach on uh, a few days ago because she fights earlier than we do. And then the heavyweights fly tomorrow oh, okay. with the other coach. So okay. we're, we're leaving, we're all meeting in San Francisco tomorrow morning. And are you bringing a training partner? How that works? Yeah, uh, there's actually a training partner. Um, the the training partner I requested is uh, uh, John Jane. He's one of our young up and coming athletes. He's he fights 90 kilos, but you know in the off season he's closer to 100 kilos, and so he's a good size for me. Mm -hmm. um, and he has a background similar to mine with uh, judo, sambo, and wrestling, and so that's kind of why I asked uh, him to help me out. And he's also going to be on the way there tomorrow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have uh, a, a prefer type of uh, throw that you? Because we know that that all judokas they do have a prefer type of attack, type of a throw. Uh, do you have one like, that you always? I do? like arm bars. I like arm bars a lot. Um, mm -hmm. So I like arm blocks. Um, I have three main throws that I get my main knockdowns with and um, one is like a Harai Goshi mm -hmm. and then uh, Ochigari and then Yoko Wakari which is kind of like a, like a lateral drop in wrestling it's similar to that and uh, those are probably the three moves that get me the majority of my, uh, my scores and then I'd say counter attacks as well hmm When you uh, walk into the mat, do you already go with uh, a little of a strategy of what you're gonna do? Uh, because you already know your opponent, you already know uh, their strength, um, and so you already go some, somehow with a strategy to attack, or you prefer to wait the, the first move from your opponent? Um, I, I watch every video out there for the girl that I'm gonna fight, um, for actually the first, several people that I could fight um, and uh, I take notes and I usually have um, 
like I have a section of my notes about, okay, this is what they do. This is what they do. That's good. This is what they do. That's not good that I could uh, take advantage of. Um, you know, this is what I have to watch out for. Um, but then I also have a section of my notes. Okay. This is how my judo could work against her judo. I'm pretty like, I'm a, I'm a total nerd about it. Like I, I write it up like it's like it's a school project. And I think that's actually kind of one of the ways that um, I'm I'm good at strategizing and that, you know, because I would love to be a coach someday, I've actually able, I've been able to help other people, you know, come up with strategies for their opponents as well. This is awesome. So you, you yeah. actually take notes of every single thing. Oh, yeah. No, no. I probably have a full page on each person. And um, that's and I have like a notebook where I keep those notes. But then before the tournament, like I'll take new notes and, and watch new stuff because you can always observe different things or come up with different ideas, um, you know, because it's not it's not an exact science. You know, mm -hmm. this could work one day. Something else could work another day. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And how do you deal, uh, because we didn't talk about that, we talk about your, 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 the physical aspect of your game, but how do you deal with nerves? Do you have any problem at all in getting too nervous? Or, and if you do not, what do you do to stay calm? Um, I, routine is really key. Like, you have to have a set routine. And I, um, it's even weird. Like, I have, I do the same warm-up. I actually do the same type of work at work, workouts the two days later tournament. Uh, so I have like a specific workout I do two days before, a specific workout a day before, then a warm up for the day I fight. Um, I eat, you know, stuff that won't bother my stomach. So I try to, you know, be careful about what food I'm eating. Uh, um, I make sure I hydrate and then I sleep as well as I can the night before I fight. And so because I might be nervous, I'm, I'm like, I'm not allowed to take a nap the day before I fight um, so that I'm sure I'll be able to sleep good the night before. Um, and then I usually take a cold shower the morning that I, I have to fight to wake myself up. And, um, you know, I, I go through the same steps. And so the routine kind of reassures me and, and focusing on the routine rather than my nerves, um, you know, keeps me from being stressed out. So when you walk in the mat at that point on that what on the side you are totally fine not nervous I mean you probably have some adrenaline going on but not really nervous right No no by the time I'm on the mat all the stress goes away um but like the minute it actually starts then it's fun you know mm -hmm. and it's actually it's 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 a game and it's a sport and that's why we do we do it you know um and and the reality is, is that, you know, yeah, of course we all want to win, but I want to do good judo right? and I want to win, you know, mm -hmm. so I'm focused on trying to make my judo work as well as it can, you know. How many, how many fights do you believe you're going to have in between the first one and the top three? Oh, okay. You mean from, oh, in order to win at the Olympics, I think you have to win five fights to win the division. So, I mean, I that would be you know to make the finals would be five fights no but, but that, that, um, that's to make the final but if you if you are on on top three if you you know work for the oh so, for like the bronze yeah i think if you win i think like three and one would probably do do a bronze medal i think it really depends because um we haven't actually um seen the final rosters yet and so there's a guarantee of 18 girls per category but then some countries are going to have their continental um, quotas, so the wild cards basically, in my category. It'll happen to be there. And then there'll be these IJF invitations as well. Mm. All right, Nina. Um, I, I think that uh, we are all, not only here in Texas, but in the U.S., we are really rooting for, for you. And we, I'm personally very happy. Uh, when I was talking to Carrie, Carrie was talking to me about your story, and Carrie is a is a fun girl. Uh, she is talking about you to everyone, <laughs> and uh, and I think it's uh, yeah. it's a it's a dream come true for you and for many people that were rooting for you as well. Well, yeah, no, I, I I've gotten so much support from so many people, and it's been really nice to, to reconnect with people. You know, I haven't heard from in years that remembered me from Gino and that said hi. And it's just been 
I've been really, really overwhelmed by the amount of support I've had, and um, I'm very grateful to it, and I hope that I can pay it forward someday. Yeah. Oh, I think mm -hmm. uh, knowing that you're going there, you're going to do your best, is already a way to, to, to make everyone proud. So uh, I, I really wish you all the yeah. best uh, on this journey. Enjoy every single moment. Uh, take tons of pictures. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Uh, to keep everyone up for to sure, date, for sure. <laughs> and uh, let, let's mm -hmm. uh, let's have fun. Yeah, for sure. I, I'm planning on having as much fun as I can, and also doing the best you that I can. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Th thank you very much, Nina, and uh, good, have a good trip. I know that you have a bunch of things to take care of tonight, uh, so I appreciate you thank taking you. your time. You have a good night, Ben. You take uh, care. You take care. Thank you.